Welcome to Prophecy Truth Today. The video you are about to view is from the late pastor Larry W. Wilson. I consider this teaching from Larry to be one of his finest. That is why I wanted to bring this to you today. I have annotated his message with some of my illustrations that you may be familiar with. When I consider the sinful nature that my country and the world is in, I realize that God's wrath is about to be released on planet Earth. Do you agree with my analysis? Leave your comments below. Soon God will release the seven trumpets of redemptive judgments onto the Earth, and initially 25% of Earth's population will be killed by these judgments. Later, the devil will order the killing of one-third of the remainder of Earth's population. This video presents many of the Bible events that will occur during the Great Tribulation in about 30 minutes. You may want to view this video several times. God bless. Art and Linda Cambig. The idea is, is that when a nation reaches a certain level of decadence, God's patience runs out, the days that were numbered are filled up, and God sends a destroyer to destroy that nation. And I use as an example the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, the Romans, and even Israel and Judah. We see the destroyer constantly. And then God ends up destroying the destroyer. <laughs> so he uses Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Israel, uh, Judah actually. And then he uses Cyrus and Darius to destroy Babylon. And then he uses Alexander the Great to destroy the Medes and the Persians. So God constantly raises up a destroyer. And, and the reason for an antichrist there is an Antichrist in the Bible. In Revelation, he's not called Antichrist. He's called a destroyer because God turns him loose to destroy the world. And I want to show you how this destroyer fits into the equation. There's a very interesting conclusion to the story. He's called a beast, appropriately so, in Revelation 13, 11. There's this beast coming up out of the earth it has two horns like the lamb, but he speaks like the dragon. This beast is the glorious appearing of the devil claiming to be God. And the world will be astonished when they see him. The world will, has no equal in, the, in, in, in history in seeing a being of this magnitude and glory. I have wondered... If the angels in Solomon's temple were life-size, I have the suspicion they are for several reasons. I won't get into that. They're about 17 feet tall, and their wingspan is 17 feet. And two angels span across the most holy place a distance of 34 feet. That would be the length of this room. That's about 30, about 35 feet, I would guess. Somebody could count the tile and give us a better number on that, but that's what I suspect. And you, you take an angel that is in that, and this is Lucifer we're talking about, and in his glory, and with a billion angels attending him, everybody on earth will be amazed. They've never seen anything like this. Put this in, put this in the best perspective. You, you, before Jesus comes, the man of sin will be revealed. He's called a man because he will take on the appearance of the glorious God-man. He will be looking like God. You would think God would in our form. But it's actually Lucifer 
the wolf in sheep's clothing, pretending to be God, masquerading as God. And, and why does God allow the devil to do this and empower him to do this? Can you tell me? What does the Bible say in 2 Thessalonians? They refuse to love the truth, and for this reason God sends them a what? Very good. Strong delusion. Wouldn't you say it's pretty strong delusion? And to prove that he is God, he will call fire down out of heaven. There went Centerville. Goes over to Moscow with all of his angels. He flies over there and all of his angels, light, you know, they land around the city there. They're at Red Square. And uh, we don't believe in God here. And half of Moscow just went up in vapor. We believe. <laughs> Whatever you want. Can't you see it? What do you say to somebody that's 17 feet tall? You start with sir. <laughs> you don't under, you got to understand that when God sends the destroyer, God has, so, has over... Daniel 8 explains the horn power that is coming at the end of the age. Daniel contributes, I could spend an entire week on this subject to, to show you how magnificent and how important and how powerful this display is going to be. And the people of earth will be no match. In fact, after his angels killed one third of mankind, what do you want? You get the, I hope you get the picture. He's going to take dominion of this earth. Let's go to the Bible. He's called a beast, and as I said, rightfully so, but I want you to see verse 8. This is talking about the beast, the lamb-like beast. And the angel says to John, the beast which you saw, John, you saw him in vision earlier back, you know, in chapter 12. He once was, the word inserted there should be visible. He once was visible. What is this word here? John saw him. And in this context, the word visible is not reiterated, it is implied. The beast which you saw once was visible, now is not, and will come up out of the invisible and go to his destruction. Over in Revelation 12, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled into the earth. As I said a few days ago, the Greek preposition there should be translated into. In the King James Version, it does say into. It's like throwing a pebble, which you can see, throw it into the pool, and now you can't see it, but at the appointed time, it comes up out of the abyss and can be seen. Let's go back to Revelation 17, 8. The beast, John, which you saw once was visible, now is not. He is held in the spirit world. You can't physically see him. He's alive. <laughs> he comes by my house every now and then. <laughs> He said he'd been over to Marge and Harvey's and they sent him over to my place. <laughs> Does he come over to your house? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> but now he's not visible, but yet he will come up in Revelation 9 out of the abyss. But where is he ultimately going? To his destruction. In Daniel chapter 8, we read that this power does not come to his end by human power, though. Humanity can't kill the devil. 
He's invincible. And that's why in Revelation 9 they have on these breastplates of iron and they have all this power and man, human beings have no, nothing that can stop them. Why, one of the devil's angels could grab, grab an ICBM missile, break it in half and lay it on the ground. Now what? <laughs> The, the power of this, you've got to understand that at one time, Lucifer was the most powerful angel in heaven. We're not talking about just the, the weakest angel is stronger than a battalion of the strongest men. One angel flew over Sennacherib's army and killed 185,000 one night. I mean, get a picture of this kind of power that we're talking about. God, when God sends the destroyer, whoa, he's going to do the destroy. And men cannot stop it. it. It will be, it will be like a swarm of locusts. Well said by John in chapter 9. Let's go back. The beast which you saw once was, now is not visible, once was visible, now is not visible, and will come up out of the abyss and be visible and go to his destruction. Now watch the next sentence. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished. Let me get this up here for you. Steve and I were just talking about this. They will be astonished when they what? What does that word mean? Visible. To visualize. When they see the beast. Because he once was visible, now is not, and yet will come up and be visible. Does that make sense to you? This is all about seeing. When the devil gets here, the world is in a mess. The religions of the world have done their best to appease God. They've done their best to establish uh, sinless laws so that the wrath of God would cease and that we might return to some form of civil life. The devil gets here and the Bible says that he opposes all that is called God. Remember that verse? Verse 4. Let me put it at the top of the screen. Speaking about the man of sin, the devil, the destroyer, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called what? Or is worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Some Christians today read this verse and they say, uh-huh, see, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. They use this verse as proof. I respond by saying, if and even if the temple in Jerusalem were rebuilt, it wouldn't be God's temple. He left there a long time ago and he's not coming back. <laughs> That's the way I read the Bible. Not, he's not coming back there. What does this phrase mean? He sets himself up in God's temple. What it means, it comes, it comes from the Judaic expression. If you go back and look at the reign of Manasseh, the Bible says that Manasseh set up in the temple of God idols. He actually put idols in the temple for people to worship. In other words, at the focus of worship, Manasseh put up an idol. The parallel is, is that in, on every one of the seven mountains, he sets himself up above everything that is called God and sets himself in the place of God. So to the Muslim, he's Allah. To the Jew, he's Messiah. To the Christian, he's Jesus. He's Almighty God. No matter what religion 
you are in or which religious group you might be in, he sets himself up as God. So he sits in the pinnacle, the place of God. Go back to the scripture there. Proclaiming himself what? To be God. And Paul says to the, Thessaloni the Thessalonians, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Now the devil will be revealed at the proper time and Paul explains that down here. Whoops, I went too far. Verse 6. He goes on and he says, And now you know what is holding him back, holding the appearance of the devil back, so that he may be revealed when? At the proper time. With God, timing is everything. When the devil gets here, the devil says, Hmm, we've got a world in a mess. I'm Almighty God. I'm going to do something that this needed to be done for a long time. I'm going to cancel everybody's religion and create a new one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Wouldn't you expect that of God? And he says, I'm going to create a religion and we're going to borrow a little of this and a little of that from everybody so that you all have something that you remember that's familiar with to you. But when Satan gets here, he abolishes all religion. And he establishes what is called in the book of Revelation an image. An image. And everyone who refuses to worship the image, to submit to the image. Simple. Kill them. The image is the consolidation of all the world's religions into one. The image of Nebuchadnezzar was the consolidation of all the metals into one. The gold, the silver, the brass, the bronze, the iron, the clay. All of that was merged and made into one and all were commanded to worship or be killed. And so the worship of the image, the image of the beast is simply the consolidation of one world. If God is on earth, how would there be less? How could there be less? How can the Muslim have a different view of God than the Christian when God is on earth? That won't work. Because now there can be no argument that God is here to settle the argument. Understand that? If there's an argument about God and God is here, there's no more argument. <laughs> it's over. God speaks. And that's precisely what he does. Notice what he does here in Revelation 13. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth and he ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword. In other words, the first beast. Verse 15, he was given power to give breath to the image so that it could speak, make laws and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. There you have it. It's coming down to worship me or be killed. The very thing the devil has wanted in the, since the beginning of sin is the worship that was due God. And at last, he gets his heart's desire. The idea of the worshiping the image is that he consolidates the diversity of man into one, one world religion. He dissolves the religions of the world. They no longer have any use. It's the image of the beast. One of the heads. You have 17 players. 17 players in this game. 
seven heads, ten horns. The ten horns aren't the Pope. The seven heads aren't the Pope. You have the Pope as only one element in 17 players. This thing is much bigger than any one religion. The beast that comes up has seven heads. If one is the papacy, who are the other six? We're talking about the beast, not the head. And he's identifying which beast it is, the one that has the head that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So he's just simply identifying the first. If I said, go out there and look for the car with a bent fender, I'm talking about the car, not the fender. I'm using the fender, though, to, to specify which car I'm talking about. And he's simply using the wounded head to indicate which beast he's talking about. In Daniel 7, the fourth beast is the nation of Rome. Out of Rome grows the little horn. The little horn power is wounded. And that vision in Daniel 7 ends with the beast being destroyed in the fire. In Revelation 13, this beast that rises is not this beast in Daniel 7. That's where the difference is. I'm saying that the beast in Revelation 13 is a beast that includes all the world, not Catholicism. I'm saying that the beast in Revelation 13 includes Catholicism because the head that was wounded is Catholicism. But this thing is much bigger. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm including 6 billion people, not 850 million Catholics. This is a much, this is a global thing. And it includes everybody from everywhere, all the seven religions of the world. The papacy and the pope and the Catholicism is one, one player of the seven. What? When, when, when Satan dissolves Catholicism, when Satan dissolves Mohammedism, when Satan dissolves Protestantism and forms a one world church worshiping him as God, these other things are past. They're over. They're of no use. In fact, that's why Paul says he opposes everything that is called God or is worshipped and sets himself up to be God. All right. After the devil has done this, he sets up and he forces everyone to receive a tattoo. I believe the mark of the beast is a tattoo either on the right hand or on the forehead. And the reason where I come on this is look at what the Bible says. He forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. I, I once wrote a Daystar article that was titled, Surprise, the mark is a mark. <laughs> Today, we want to make it all kinds of things. You know, it's a big computer over in Brussels, or it's some kind of barcode chip, or something that you're going to put your hand under a scanner, and all these kinds of high-tech stuff, and so forth and so on. When we get to this point in the development of coming events, there won't be enough electricity to run this laptop computer. A tattoo works in the dark or in the light. <laughs> A tattoo. Let me show you. Let's go on. I'll show you why I believe it's a tattoo. No one can buy or sell unless he had the mark. So let's say, Harvey, you want to buy a loaf of bread. Symbolic loaf of bread? <laughs> you show me a symbolic mark. <laughs> no. If you want to buy or sell, you show that you belong to the new world order. <laughs> it's a tattoo it's indelible and you reach out to take it get this this is the key this is the key point the, the, the mark is not imposed on you 
the mark is offered to those who join so that you can receive whatever necessities are available. If you wish to buy or sell, you join. If you refuse to worship your persona non grata, you're going to be killed. So that's where this boil, that's what this boils down to. So going back to the scripture there, no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is A, the name of the beast, or B, the number of his name. The mark comes in two flavors. Satan's lieutenants will wear the tattoo, the name that Satan takes. We don't know what that name will be. But he will take a name and it will be tattooed across the forehead of his lieutenants. And I showed you last night how that that's a parallel of what God does to his servants, the 144,000. Counterfeit, same thing. And then the 666 will be the number of his name. And God has preordained so that it cannot be... You don't have to know anything about the Bible to know that 666 is bad. What did Ronald Reagan do? <laughs> Remember? When he bought the house where he now lives, the address was 666 such and such street. And the city council changed it at his request. <laughs> That's right. You don't have to know anything about... God is, has set up the final test so obvious that anybody, anybody can know what the truth is if they want to know. God is that anxious to save. Amen? So, if this calls... And actually in the Greek, this sentence here, this calls for wisdom. It's... It's a play on words. I interpret this to be what's called a litotis. It's a form of expression that is a gross understatement. And what it means, if anybody has two marbles <laughs> at the time when it comes, at the time when it comes, anybody who has two marbles working will figure this out. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the man's, it's an anarthrous noun there, it is the man's number, the man of sin. His number is 666. Six, six. Well, you know what to avoid. Now, let me close, not just uh, three minutes here, and I want to close with just a couple of interesting thoughts. God is going to allow the devil to come and to conquer the earth. And, at a, and after he has killed a third of mankind, the population of the earth, I calculate to be about half of what it now is. Three billion. And as, and as Lucifer and his angels fly from place to place, taking care of business, Satan divides the world up into ten sectors and he appoints ten kings over these ten sectors. That's where the ten horns are. These are the ten kings, the ten toes of Daniel 2. Ten toes. In the days of these kings will the God of heaven set up his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. The ten horns are the ten kings and he will choose them and he will put them and they are his puppets governing over humanity. And these kings have but one purpose in their mind, and that's to give their authority to the devil. So they're puppets. Satan is moving to accomplish the final annihilation of God's children. And he sets up the universal death decree at the 1290th day on the full moon. But it won't happen. After the seventh trumpet comes to a close, God, no more losses of life for God's children. Because there's no more point in letting the martyrs continue. Salvation's offer is drawn to a close and it's over. So God's children run for the rocks and the mountains. And they're hiding from the authorities who are going to track them down and kill them. Because Satan is in insistent. This is what he's ultimately after is to destroy the people of God. Well, God starts dismantling Babylon, you know, stick by stick. 
And so when the time of the 1290th day gets here, God pours out great, a great plague on the seat of the beast. And he strips him of his authority. And as they are about to kill God's people, all of a sudden they discover that the one they've been following is the devil. God unmasks the devil before he gets here before God gets here. Jesus unmasks the devil so that the world can see they've been duped, they've been deceived, they've been following the devil. Well, this isn't the end of the story. The end of the story goes like this. Even after being shown that whom that the person they are following is Lucifer, the devil, the people of earth continue to follow. Can you believe it? Satan tells them that Jesus is coming and that their only hope of saving themselves is to join with him in fighting the Lamb. I want to close starting here in Revelation 19.11. I want you to get this picture in your mind. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. His victories, his many victories. He not only wears the diadema, he wears the Stephanos. He is the overcomer. He is also the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. This new name, this new name is what we're going to call Jesus through eternity. He hasn't been revealed yet, but we'll soon know what it is. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will tread them. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds had a picnic. Amen. <laughs> the birds gorged themselves. What this is telling us, and basically here's the end of the story, God sends when the world reaches the cup of iniquity. He finally sends a destroyer who makes a mess of the whole thing. But ultimately, the greater destroyer comes from heaven. And he comes to destroy sin and all who love it. He comes to destroy death and sorrow and pain and suffering. He comes as the mighty destroyer with healing in his wings. Wow. What a God. What a God. 
He comes to rescue his children and to destroy their enemies. What a God. Dear friends, all that matters in the final analysis is whether you're on God's side or not. 